Amen. Welcome to Dublin Baptist Church. I invite you to stand with us as we begin to worship our Lord and Savior. Well, you can be seated as uh, we, listen, I've got a lot of announcements to get through, so um, get comfortable, uh, but don't check out, okay? Don't, don't do that. Uh, first of all, for all of you watching online, we're so glad that you are joining in with us and watching this way. Uh, you can always leave us comments there in the comments section, and you can also uh, leave prayer requests. We would love to pray for you, and we'll follow up on, on all of that. So if, if you have those needs, we would love to do that. Um, let me just say this first. Hasn't Tim done a good job uh, the last few weeks helping us and leading? You've done great. Thank you. And uh, Nathan and Keegan have been out for, you know, mission trip and vacation and everything. So uh, they'll all be coming back this week. So we're getting so excited about that. And uh, for all our leaders in ministry, uh, hopefully you got an email from me about July the 10th. Uh, July the 10th will be a big Sunday. Uh, a lot of things going on. One thing is we're going to have a ministry fair, and you're going to have an opportunity to see 
what the ministries of our church do, talk to people involved in that, and sign up for some things. And so uh, we want to do that. So leaders, today, as you leave, go by the library. Uh, the display boards are there. Start to craft your display and represent your team and, and, and do all that. And get ready for the 10th as uh, we get ready to do that. Uh, so let's talk about our one big thing. Our one big thing this week is Vacation Bible School. And uh, we're really getting excited. It's just a few weeks away. Uh, on this uh, sheet that you picked up is a QR code at the bottom, and that's to register kids. So if you have uh, children to, to register or you know neighbors who have kids who might want to come, uh, they can register through that QR code. So you can take that to them, drop it off at a neighbor's house or whatever to invite them to be a part of that. And so you can do that. Uh, we're also really excited because out in the lobby are all the signs for areas that we need help with. And you can sign up there. And so uh, just kind of walk the hall outside here, the lobby. As uh, you leave the service, you'll see signs for uh, like rec and teaching and various things. And there's a QR code there. You can click on that to sign up to serve in those areas. And so you need to do that because next Sunday, there's a lunch. There's a lunch for our VBS workers, uh, kind of an orientation, presentation, understanding of everything and how we're doing that. And uh, we're really excited about that. I saw a lot of you signing up for the fingerprinting. That's still going to happen today. And so uh, if you're going to work with our minors and haven't finished that background check, that's what you need to do. Uh, another reason we're super excited about VBS this year is because we get to do VBS with Amy Curry. And Amy is here. So Amy, come join me. I know, uh, surprise. I, and, and the kids, listen, I heard you singing. On that first song, I heard you singing. You did good. Uh, Amy came uh, on Thursday. She arrived Thursday. First day in the office was Friday. And you all, she came in with a tote. Come on up here. And uh, she came in with this tote full of stuff for the office. And the first thing she pulled out was a turvis that had Buckeyes, Brutus, and the OSU logo on it. <laughs> She's going to do great. And we want to help you do great, okay? So we got some things to help you, okay? So, so we do. We want to help you a little bit, so you need that. And then you can wear this with it, see? And that'll be great. So then you're all set up, right? She's set up. That's great. Thank you, Thank you so much. If you really want to help Amy, sign up. Help her and get her some uh, workers and volunteers and do that, and uh, we'll have a wonderful time with that. Uh, also, we're getting ready for um, the Bill Glass ministry. That's coming up in July to go to the prisons. Training is on the 15th. It's in the evening. We'll have dinner, and then we'll do the training. Then Saturday the 16th, we go into the prisons. If you would like to be a part of that, you need to visit the Bill Glass website, register for the event, and uh, start that background check. You've got some time, but there's a background check clearance that has to be done for the prison uh, to be a part of that. So please do that uh, for us. Uh, I also have one more thing. See, I told you we had a whole lot. I want you to watch this short video uh, from the Matthews. Uh, we support the Matthews, uh, the missionary work they do through crew and with college campuses across uh, the southeast. And so this is a video I got to do with them as I got to talk to them about the ministry they do. Uh, if you'll watch this, and then we'll come back and uh, talk about offering. So Dublin Baptist Church, it is my pleasure to get to bring to you Todd and Christine Matthews who serve with crew. Hi, Todd. Hi, Christine. Thank you for joining us uh, via Zoom for a Dublin Baptist Church. Uh, we appreciate well, you hello. and your ministry so much. Um, yeah, Todd, go ahead. Tell us some of what you do with crew. Well, currently, I'm working as the field director which is similar to like a human resource director, but we do a lot with leadership development, staff care, staff training, staff development, really building our staff so that every college student on every campus can get an opportunity to hear the gospel. And we're doing that work over the states of Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Christine and I are working on, on a team together. 
Wow, so you're down there in the southeast helping college students, okay, engaging in missions. That, that, that's amazing. I'm sure in that uh, you've seen God do some amazing things. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you've seen God do in the ministry uh, that you're leading there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's our vision to see every college student have an opportunity to hear the gospel. That would be every student on every campus in every nation. And so we're currently in over 190 nations all over the world, um, focusing primarily here in the United States. Um, but you know, we view the, those years in college as, as a really critical uh, stage of life, a, a, a period in life where key decisions are being made. And so we have found that that's where the gospel really intersects many lives and young men and young women, you know, own and appreciate it for themselves perhaps for the first time. So we feel like that's a critical fork in the road for students making that decision. There's so many stories we could tell on a bigger picture. During the time of COVID, um, our staff really kind of had to get creative to figure out how do we keep engaging students when the university, uh, for all intents and purposes, was, was shut down. And so our team at the University of Georgia, uh, they figured, hey, students are hanging out online, they're on Instagram, they're lonely, um, many are trying to find community, but, but they're home alone, what, what can we do to reach them? And they developed an Instagram strategy, which enabled them to, to find students who were studying at the University of Georgia and find out if they had spiritual interest. Well, long story short, they connected with over 2,400 students who came and checked out the, the crew Instagram website. And it led to 130 freshmen connecting with the ministry. And that was all student-led. Students were reaching other students on Instagram because there was an incredible hunger for the gospel. And the, the director at the University of Georgia said that was the highest number of freshmen they've ever engaged with in a year. And it happened in a pandemic. Uh, so we see God at work at a really critical time. Wow, that and is just amazing. Another, yeah. yeah. Another fun story that our son actually experienced at the University of Central Florida here in Orlando is um, a group of guys just, because I think there was just a hunger for connecting, they um, would gather for Bible study, they'd all bring their lawn chairs and circle up on the top of a parking garage outside. And they ended up with such a huge group that they had to split into smaller groups to have discussions. And that group of guys has really become um, a core group of leaders in that ministry still. It's still going on. Wow. Yeah. So even in the midst of the pandemic, uh, you're creatively finding ways for yeah. the gospel and ministry to go forward. Yeah. That is, that is great. Um, it's one of the reasons that we love to invest in in a mission and in you and the work that you do and uh, you are part of our budget and so explain to us a little bit about what uh, our giving as a church means for you and the work that you're doing on college campuses well we're just incredibly grateful to dbc and when i think about it my gratefulness starts back in 1988 when i graduated from miami university moved home I'd gotten involved in crew, and I knew that I needed to find a solid church where people love Jesus, and the Lord led me to DBC in 1988. And so, um, I, DBC has been a core part of just my growth and um, the relationships. My mom actually ended up going to DBC and was a member there until she went home to be with Jesus in this last June. So, I'm just incredibly grateful to DBC in general. Yeah, and I, I would echo that, you know, JD, um, DBC has been such an integral part of all the work that we're doing. It's every conference and every training that I go to, one of the first things I share is that those staff or those students we're ministering to are being prayed for, and they have a community of believers that are investing in the work of the gospel. So really, when I think of DBC, I think of uh, linking arms to be a part of the mission together. Everywhere I go, I, I know I'm being supported by, not just financially as important and um, as humbled as we are by that, but the prayer support is incredible. And typically we send out a prayer request before you know any bigger event that we wanna do or any training we're a part of. 
um, because we just know the value of prayer. We can't do it alone. We need the body of Christ. Um, and DBC has uniquely been really engaged with us, having um, a mission liaison as a member who's checking in with us, uh, making sure we're doing okay and praying for us has been, has been really significant. There's a whole lot more we talked about. We couldn't get it all in right now, but if you'll check our Facebook page on the mission site and we'll link to it on the main site, you can see that whole video. I'm gonna ask my ushers if they'll come forward. We're gonna collect an offering and you need to know that, that we give to support missions. We give to support people like the Matthews who do the work they do with crew and college campuses. And there are, there are dozens of other missionaries we support in that way. In addition, we're giving through that cooperative program and supporting missionaries across North America, around the world. Your giving makes a huge difference in sending the gospel out. And so I want to thank you for your faithful giving as it goes to support work all around uh, the globe, here in Dublin and all the way around in places we've never heard of. So thank you for your giving. Let's pray. Father God, we gather here to be reminded of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. That God, we remember his death. We remember his resurrection. We remember the hope that comes from his sacrifice that brings us life. God, we think about people who have yet to hear that, people who don't know that, people who haven't made that a part of their life yet. And God, we want to support those that help to do that. So God, as we give, we give so that that gospel can be shared. And God, we give to missionaries and to ministries that send that forth. So God, take what is given, multiply it and use it that others would know the great truth about Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph Oh my God will never fail Yes my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, yeah. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Sing this. There's power. Turn it for good. You turn. 
amazing what God does for us each and every day, how he takes care of our needs, how he, we can see that victory that he gives us when we trust in him and only when we trust in him and we're trying to do it on our own. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't. When we look to him and we give him that, that crown, we, we crown him as our king of our life. That's what's important. That's what we need to think about. Um, and, and that's where he needs to be in our lives. This song is about victor's crown that God has in our lives. And I just, I just want you to think about the words as we sing, as we um, say this message. Let it be the, let it be the prayer of your heart. You are 
When I was in college, we had Calvin Miller come and share in the chapel and then come to a theology class and speak. Now, I'd never read anything by Calvin Miller. I didn't know who he was, and so uh, everybody was impressed, but I didn't understand why we were. Um, And so he came to the class, and he began to talk in terms of the story of Jesus, about his death, his burial, his resurrection. And he started to talk about how that story is played out in culture, in literature, in all kinds of places. And I began to think, nah. And uh, he said this. He said, one of the greatest pictures of it in our time, and, you know, you got to remember this was back in the, what, the late 80s, early 90s. He said was E.T. You remember the movie E.T. about the extraterrestrial and all that? And that's when I really said, nah, that How do you get Jesus out of E.T.? He said, well, he came from a different world. He came to our world. He made a band of followers, and they started to follow him around. He did miracles. He made the bike fly. He died. He rose again, and he ascended, and he left you with the idea that he could return again. And I went, E.T.'s a Christological story. (laughs) And I began to look for that story everywhere. It's all throughout literature in all kinds of places. Anytime we find somebody sacrificing for something greater than themselves, we get a little touch of that. Whether it's Braveheart and how he dies for a country or a variation on Romeo and Juliet and how we die for one that we love. That picture keeps repeating. But even in areas like E.T. or Braveheart or Romeo or Juliet where, or wherever else we find it, they are shadows. They are pale comparisons of the true story. They keep pointing back to this story, this account of what Jesus did that is beyond anything we really can comprehend. It's something that is so significant, we never get over it. This morning, I want to take you to the book of Isaiah. I want to take you to a chapter that I'm sure you're fairly familiar with of chapter 53, and I want us to look at the sacrifice of Jesus. We're going to celebrate a Lord's Supper together. We're going to remember how Jesus died for our sins, but I want us to dive deeper into that. I want us to really think about what the sacrifice of Jesus means and how it is far greater than anything we'll ever read in the pages of a book or see on the screen of a movie. That this, this is the picture of what forever changes our life. We talk about how the gospel changes us on the inside, the outside, and forever. The heart of the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins. Isaiah lays it out. He's in a very prophetic way going to point to the Messiah and how he will die. And he's going to give us pictures and glimpses of of what needs to be fulfilled in the death of Jesus. And as we read it, as we walk through it, I just want us to go back and to consider what it means that Jesus died for our sins. So would you stand with me? Let's begin in verse 4 of chapter 3 and let's see what the prophet Isaiah would tell us about the death of Jesus. He writes, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for this generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked 
And with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when, he makes, when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil among the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressions. Father God, we come to remember the death of Christ, the sacrificial death of the Savior, the suffering servant who endured the agony and the pain, the humiliation, the shame, the wrath, and the judgment that the cross brought so we could be forgiven. God, may we be gripped by that, that we would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. For us, the cross becomes a central point. We look at it, and in it we see this this culmination of who Jesus is and why he came and the purpose of his life. And, And it is part of what we look at, and it begins to remind us of all that wraps around Jesus. But sometimes maybe we get too familiar with it. Maybe sometimes we know it too well. I, I grew up in the church. I've, I've heard this since I was young. Jesus died for our sins. And sometimes I'm guilty of saying, yeah, but what else? Like, I know that. I understand that. I've got that. And, and let's move on. What, what else? There's so much there to really understand that Jesus died for our sins. That we don't need to rush past that. That we would do well to linger there and not just take it on the surface, but to dive deep. What does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? The prophet Isaiah lingers there for a whole chapter. There are three stanzas to his prophetic poetry here, and they're broken up into three sets of three verses. And so I want us to look at each stanza and us to dive deep, just to consider What does the death of Jesus mean? To to meditate on that, think about that, ponder that, linger there. That as we get ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we would really remember what it is we're celebrating. So let's start with the first stanza, verses 4, 5, and 6, that talk about the painful sacrifice of Jesus Here Isaiah begins to lay out what the death of the Messiah would be like. He starts in verse 4 by saying he has carried our sorrows. One of the things that will mark Jesus is this title of man of sorrows. It it talks about the emotional anguish, the weight of it, and what he endures. And, And when we get to Matthew's gospel, we see a picture of that in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there is Jesus is preparing to go to the cross. He's with his disciples. He he wants them to pray for them. In, In chapter 26, verse 38, he says this, then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. He's carrying the burden, the weight, the emotional weight of what dying for the sin of the world means. It's his sorrow that's marked there. But it's not just that. There's a physical nature to the cross and to what he will be uh, carrying. That he, verse 5 says he was pierced for our transgression. That's a great translation for the word. Sometimes it's wounded, but, but the word literally means to be wounded by a piercing. And of course, for us, one of the things that we would remember 
is the nails. The nails that would be driven through the hands and the feet. That later on, Jesus would say, you shall look upon the one you have pierced. And he quotes Old Testament prophecy about that. The piercing marked Jesus. You, you know, when we get to heaven, everything is remade. Everything is new. Everything is perfected. But there's one thing from the old world that still lingers. And it's the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. The piercing. How they drove the nails through. The physical anguish of that. And in the Old Testament, in the Passover, when they would make the unleavened bread, to help it to bake, they would have to put holes in it so the air could circulate around. So when they celebrated Passover, they pulled out bread that was already pierced to mark the life of Jesus. Piercing marks who he is and, and what he's about. But, but he also dies on this cross. He's pierced for our transgressions. He's crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought us peace. That, that there is this death of Christ. And the way he was crucified defines him. You, you know that in the Roman system, there, there were offenses. There were crimes. And then there were crimes. And the highest punishment they had was crucifixion. To be crucified puts you in a class of criminals that were considered the worst of the worst. That that's what defined Jesus. Not, not, not his teaching, not, not his uh, uh, miracles. That, that now it is how he died. Again, Matthew says this, chapter 27, verse 38. Then two robbers were crucified with him. One on the right, one on the left. It's who he, who he now is. He's crucified. And he's marked with robbers. To be crucified was a curse in the Jewish world. To be hung on a tree was, was to incur that wrath. That, that with it came this shame. The weight of a shame. The, the, the writer of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 12 too, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. The shame to be crucified among thieves, the, the shame about the, the openness of all of that, to, to be hung up in public, to be naked, to be dead, dying, to have blood, to be condemned in that way. And then on top of that, the, Roman, the curse of the Jews that went on that, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Paul repeats it in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So why would Jesus do it? Why would he endure the emotional, the physical, the societal, the religious, all the pain, all the agony, all the shame, everything that's wrapped up in it? Why would he do it? Isaiah tells us there that all of us have gone astray like sheep. One of the things we're incredibly good at is being selfish. We like to live for ourselves. Whether it is we want to be popular or whether it is we want to be liked or whether it is we want to pursue pleasure or whether it is we want status or, or whatever it is, it always comes back to us. And so we go off and we do our own thing because what we really want to satisfy is us. But Isaiah says there's a cure to that. He tells us this, that by his wounds, we are healed. That as Jesus endured the punishment there was, that is part of the healing. That we can find this, this healing, this victory, this, this freedom, this forgiveness from our sins that leads us astray to really come back to God. And in that, there is this hope of a healing. But it's only possible through this painful sacrifice that Jesus makes. But it wasn't just the physical nature of it, it's the prophetic nature of it. That the next few verses, 7, 8, and 9, he begins to talk about how all this was God's plan. All of this was God's will. And the way it was laid out, 
It says he was oppressed and afflicted. Oppression here is a, a word that means to work, but it means a forced work. It, it might be something better explained as slavery. To be forced to work for someone else and for what they want and for their benefit. That the only thing God could ever accept was a sinless sacrifice. And Jesus came to do the work of the Father. That's what he kept saying, is I, I come to fulfill what the Father has sent me to do. I do the work that glorifies my Father. I don't speak of my own accord. I speak what the Father has given me. All of this was about the Father. It was about what he wanted. And in that it says he was afflicted because of this. This word afflicted can mean to be wretched, to be bent over, to be emaciated. It's the idea that the weight of the task that is on him to fulfill what God demands has such a weight that physically, Physically, it's evident in how he is bent over, how he is afflicted, how it forces his body and, and, and the, the elements that are there that, that here is this weight Jesus takes on to say, I will do the work the Father has given me to do no matter what it costs. And he knows what it costs. He knows it's going to cost him his life. The, the verse 8, he says he was oppressed by the judgment and taken away. It seized him. It grabbed him. It took him. And then the prophet Isaiah asked this question in the middle of all of this, who among this generation would consider any of this? He says, who in the middle of this stopped and said, now wait a minute, let's talk about this. Let's analyze this. Let, let's debate this. What, what does this mean that Jesus would be suffering like this, that Jesus would be under the weight of it? No one. Those around the cross mocked. Those around the cross said, well, if you've saved others, save yourself. That we who are selfish say, well, as long as I get what I want, that, that's all that matters. Who really weighs this out? Who really counts what this costs? So Isaiah does it for us. Could we consider that he was cut off from the land of the living? To be separated and, and, and forsaken from the land of the living. Now, now think about this. Jesus, God in flesh, is life. He doesn't just give us life. When we come to Jesus, we find eternal life. But who Jesus is, is the very essence and source of life. He would tell his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So he who is life took on a human form to die so we could have life. And he knew this from the beginning. It's, it's there when Jesus is born. The, these wise men come and they bring in gifts, gold for a king, frankincense for a god. But myrrh, myrrh was an embalming agent for those that had died. From his birth, it has been I came to do the work the Father gave me. And the work the Father gave me was to live a perfect life and then lay it down. That's the task. That's what it's about. And we, we would do well to consider that. As we come to a table, as we say, I, I know that Jesus died for our sins, so... Maybe we know that in our head, but how deep does it go in our heart? That he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of the people. That's you and me. Transgressions are the crimes, the things we've done, that we violated God's law, we broke his commands. He, he died for us to do all of that and that he was stricken by all that, that he was stricken, beaten, hurt, attacked. And why? Isaiah lays it out one more time, and he says that although he has done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Violence here is a term that, that means violence, but it means wrongful violence. It, it is that violence that is done with the wrong motives or the wrong heart or the wrong intention. It is it is beating someone else to, up to take something from them. It's dominating them so you can establish your position of authority. It's anything like that. There was a violence tied to war. Uh, that was different. That, that's when soldiers go to battle and we kind of get it's going to be war. It's going to be violent. It's going to be bloody. That, that's battle. This is abuse of power. 
And Jesus never used his position as the God of the universe wrongly. No deceit in his mouth. Everything that came out was truth. After all, he said, I am the truth. This perfect life came into this world knowing he was going to die for your sins and my sins. And yet he did it. Yet he did it. Again, I'm back at why. Why would the creator of all the universe do that? Why would that be God's plan from the beginning? Well, that's what the last stanza is about, the propitional sacrifice of Jesus, that this is the only thing God could accept, the only propitiation given that God would accept is that someone perfect would die in our place for our sins. Verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, to break him into pieces. God would accept that. That was the will of God. It was the only thing. You and I, because of our sin, because we go astray, the way we live, the transgressions, the crimes we've done, our selfish nature, all of that, because of all of that, there are two ways you can handle your sin. The first way is this. You can handle your sin on your own. And if you handle your sin on your own, here's what that means. You will die in your sin. And you will die for your sin. And you will experience the judgment that dying in sin brings which is eternal death. That's really the picture of hell. Jesus says it's a place of incredible torture, of agony, of weeping and gnashing of teeth, but the worm doesn't die. It is experiencing death over and over and yet not being able to die and find the end. You can, you can deal with your own sin on your own, but it will cost you your life and all your experience is death for all eternity, what the Bible calls a second death. That's how you can handle it. But for some reason, God loves us so much that he doesn't want a separation. And so he sent Jesus to die in our place. That substitutionary atonement that he would die there. He says, when his soul makes an offering for the guilt. When Jesus dies in our place, then God can accept that death and grant us life. And suddenly we can have a new life in Jesus. We can have a hope of a life that extends forever. We can have a new relationship with God. The reason God sent Jesus was so that he could die for your sin and my sin so that we could reestablish this relationship with God for all eternity. But why did Jesus agree to it? Why did Jesus say, yes, I'll go. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll die in their place. Isaiah helps us. Here's what he says. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. What would Jesus see? What would he see that satisfies him? This word for satisfy is oftentimes used uh, in the Hebrew for like a banquet or a meal. It's the idea of this great table set forward with all this food and, and great delicacies and, and just an opulent sort of place and, and the people you're eating with being the greatest company you could imagine and, and having this meal that, that just is fabulous in every way and at the end you can push back from a table and say, I am satisfied. What satisfies Jesus? Why would he agree to all this? Out of the anguish he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, that's Jesus, make many to be accounted righteous. When the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to you and me, when it covers us, he's satisfied. He says that's why I came. It says by the knowledge. It really is a word that has the idea of sweat built into it. It's work, it's anguish, it's pain, it's toil. It's the idea maybe of a mother in labor that when, when the contractions come and the birth comes and, and all the pain and all the struggle and all the agony that's a part of that, yet when the child is born, it's worth it. Jesus looked at the cross and said, if they are forgiven and my righteousness can cover them, it will be 
worth it. I'll be satisfied. I'll be fulfilled. You and I, when we really understand what the death of Jesus brings, we realize that it's the only thing that can change our life. And in that moment, Jesus says, yes, and that's why I did what I did. It's what satisfies him. When I was a kid, my preacher preached, and I remember the story he told. It was about a boy that who had gone on vacation. He'd end up in Florida, and he was on the beach and walking on the shore, and there were all these starfish on the shore, and the tide had gone out, and the morning sun was coming up, and what he knew was those starfish were going to die on that shore. The sun was going to come out. It was going to bake them. The water wasn't going to come in. And so he began the task of saving starfish. He'd pick them up and throw them back in the ocean. And so he was making his way down a beach, throwing starfish in an ocean when an old man came along and said, son, what are you doing? He said, I'm saving starfish. He said, boy, don't you know, those starfish are all up and down the shore. They're, they're everywhere. You're never going to be able to save them all. What, what difference does it make? And the boy had one starfish in his hand. And he looked at it. And then he threw it as far as he could into the ocean. And he looked at the old man and said, made a difference for that one. Jesus said, I left the 90 and 9 for the one. Doesn't make any sense to leave 99. Unless you're the one. Jesus died for my sins. Personal. Do you know that? I mean, not is that a story you've heard. It's not, not just, you know, something good in culture we can talk about. It's not just, okay, I get the theme of the Bible. It's not even, yeah, I did that once a long time ago. Do you get that Jesus died to change your life? And is it a process you're engaged in every day? Is it something you, you look at and say, okay, on some level I can talk about it theologically. Some level I can talk about what it means experientially. But to really understand why Jesus died and what all it means, it still grips me and I never get over it. He came to die for me, my sins that separated me from God. That's why he came. And I, my only hope is that Jesus came to die for me. Maybe you've never made that decision. Maybe you've never really done that. Maybe you know everything about Jesus. You could tell the story better than I could. Maybe you've never heard it before and it's the first time. Probably somewhere in between those two poles. But it's never been your story. It's been a story, but not your story. Maybe it is your story, but in the process of life, you've gotten busy and, and uh, moving this way or that way. And what you need to come back and just, as Isaiah would say, let us consider what does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? So in these next few moments, the worship team's gonna come. We're gonna sing a song of commitment. And before we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Let's take some time individually to consider what the death of Jesus means for us, how he died for our sins. There are places to pray up here. I'd invite you to do that. I'm going to wait down front. If you've never made that decision, I would love to share with you how you could know Jesus died for your sins to take them away. But in these next few moments, this is a time for you to really reflect on what the death of Jesus means so that when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's not just something we do. It marks who we are. Would you stand with me? Father God, as we go into this moment, God, would your spirit stir our hearts and our minds. That God, we would truly reflect on what it means that Jesus died for us. That we would consider the price that was paid, the pain he endured, and his willingness to do it all that we might be forgiven.
In Jesus' name, amen. You'll be seated, gentlemen, if you'll make your way forward. Let's celebrate a Lord's Supper together.
to consider this sacrifice that was made. You have a portion that has the bread on the top. If you'll peel that off, you'll find a bit of the bread in there. If you'll take that out. This bread is to represent the life Jesus lived. Sinless. Perfect. It was something that had to be done so he could be the sacrifice. Only a sinless life could die for our sins. Jesus had no sin of his own to die for, but he chose to take your sin and my sin on himself 
and die in our place. Jesus took the bread that night. He blessed it before the disciples, and then they ate it. Would you pray with me? Father God, may we consider the sinless life of Jesus, the perfection, how we fulfilled everything that Old Testament prophecy required, how we did it all without any violence or deceit, how in every way, always perfect and always submissive to the will of the Father, that he could be our sacrifice. Father God, we thank you for this sinless life lived so it could be laid down. In Jesus' name, amen. Then if you turn it over, there's a a cup section. The cup represented his blood, how he died. The bread represents how he lived. The cup represents how he died. That he poured his blood out. The Bible makes it clear without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. That Jesus took this cup and said, I'm poured out like a drink offering. This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As with the bread, he took the cup and blessed it as well. Would you pray with me again? Father God, may we consider the price that was paid for the forgiveness of our sins. Not just the sinless life, but the death that was died. The painful nature of it. But God, the shame, the weight, the wrath, the judgment, all that was a part of that death so that we could be forgiven and have life. But Father God, may we truly think and remember that Jesus died for our sins and what that means. That we would live under his righteousness and not our own. And in doing so, he might be satisfied. In Jesus' name. As usual, you you can take that home. It's always good to put that in a place where maybe you see it to remind you of the sacrifice that Jesus made. Um, Again, I want to encourage you to take time in the lobby to look and sign up for one of our uh, places for VBS as we get ready for that. You also have a deacon this week. Your deacon this week is Joel Laser, and he's made himself available for you. And so he's going to come, tell you how you can get a hold of him, and then dismiss us in prayer. I just want to take a moment to thank Pastor for his leadership of this body of Christ. We thank you that he so consistently preaches God's word. And I want to say we love you and we continue to pray for you. Thank you, you, Pastor. My name is Joel Laser. As he said, you can contact me um, at deacons at Dublin Baptist Church. I'm excited for the opportunity to serve you this week. Uh, You can contact the church, uh, leave a message, and they will also get in contact with me. My phone number is in the uh, church directory. So if you have a prayer need, if I do it right, I got two ears, and I can listen good, uh, if nothing else. Um, And I will pray for you, or if you have a uh, a visitation that you would uh, like me to make, I'd be glad to serve you in any way possible. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as a pastor said, Jesus is life. And as Jesus himself said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. We pray that you would allow us to live an abundant life in Jesus this week so that we can make a difference in the life of one person. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.